Welcome to the final part of our series on Israel. We conclude our journey in two of the country's largest and most important cities, in ancient and traditional Jerusalem, and in modern and cosmopolitan Tel Aviv. In this episode, we visit the 3,000-year-old city on the hills of Judea, and follow the footprints of the ancient Jewish, Muslim, and Christian kingdoms that built and rebuilt their versions of a sacred Jerusalem over the centuries. Then we'll travel to Tel Aviv on the Mediterranean coast, where the liberal and easygoing lifestyle of its worldly residents is celebrated just as religiously. So join us, I'm David Saldran, and this is Executive Class. No wonder this is called the center of the world. Jerusalem is the holy city for the three great monotheistic religions of the world. For the Jews, this was the city of David, the place of Solomon's temple. For the Muslims, this was where the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. And for Christians, this was where Jesus Christ was crucified, where he died, and where he was resurrected. The view from the Mount of Olives gives you a better idea of what this means. On the Temple Mount, where Solomon's Temple once stood, is the Golden Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, built by the Muslim Umayyad Caliphs, and partially obscured, the Church and the Holy Sepulchre of Christian Byzantines, later rebuilt by Crusader kings. Indeed, no other place in the world I can think of is as revered and is hotly contested as Jerusalem. The ancient city within the walls has seen more cycles of conquest and persecution than any other. No doubt, a tragic irony for such a holy place, and one that calls itself the City of Peace. Save for sporadic incidents, Jerusalem is peaceful today, and pilgrims of every religious persuasion can worship openly and mingle among themselves freely. It's hard to believe that in the past, a scene like this one wasn't always tolerated so easily. Though the old city changed hands constantly, it's been under the control of Israel since 1967, the first time for the Jews in over 2,000 years. But apart from the Star of David that flies over the citadel, Jerusalem's skyline remains distinctly multicultural. The best way to explore the old city is on foot. And one of the best ways to enter it is through the Jaffa Gate. You'll know it's the Jaffa Gate because of this landmark behind me, named after me, the Tower of David. The Crusaders called it David's Gate during the reign. The current name Jaffa was given by the Ottoman Turks who ruled the city for 400 years. Hi, hello. Hello, David. good morning. Hello. Welcome to Jerusalem. It's, it's nice. a common name here, right, David? Yes, indeed. This is David City, and today you're going to see a lot of Davids once you walk on the Ramparts Walk. We are standing at one of the main gates of the old city of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Ramparts Walk takes visitors on a historical tour above the walls built by the Ottomans 450 years ago. The Ottoman were here, and especially uh, the uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And he decided to secure this city in order to strengthen it economically. So he built the walls, and since he wants business to go on, he put this very special sign here. Where is it? It's inside there, okay. and it says in Muslim language, La illa billallah wa Ibrahim halilallah, meaning that there is no God by God, this is from the Quran, and usually it ends that Muhammad is his prophet. But here, since he wanted business, he said that Ibrahim, Abraham, your 
ancestor. He was smart. Okay. He wanted more people coming yes, in, he wanted, not just the Muslims. Exactly. He, he wanted, wanted to include all the Jews at the city. Jews, to do business Christians, and the Christians and Muslims. All those who believe in the one patriarch, Abraham. Suleiman's reign in the region was one of the most tolerant, well, at least for Jerusalem standards. That's why he's acknowledged by Jews, Muslims and Christians, who, like me, don't mind donning a costume to look like the Ottoman Sultan. But it's a great Jewish king, David, that looms largest over the city. David conquered Israel 1,400 years before Suleiman did and made it his capital. Here on the so-called King David's Path, you'll come across views of David's Tower and David's Citadel, King David's Tomb on Mount Zion, the ruins of the ancient city of David, even the modern King David Hotel. I have to say, it's quite an honor to be named David in this city. The tour is a walk back through more than three millennia, maybe five even. Every stone here tells a story, and archaeologists are always coming across new discoveries. And every quarter you pass offers a unique side of the sacred city. The Armenian quarter was settled by Armenian Christians in the 4th century AD, and have lived here uninterrupted ever since. From above the Armenian quarter is the best view of the Roman Catholic Church of the Dormition, which commemorates the eternal sleep of Mary the mother of Jesus. The 19th century church on sacred Mount Zion was built over the ruins of Byzantine and Crusader churches destroyed by Muslim armies. Remember, in Jerusalem, almost every holy site was built over someone else's sacred shrine. This is an interesting point of view atop Zion Gate. This single picture behind me explains what Jerusalem, the city, is all about. First of all, a holy city. You see the three different faiths represented in this picture alone. The synagogue, the white dome, the golden dome, which is a Muslim mosque. And then of course, you see some crucifixes here and there representing the Christian religion. Apart from that, it's a living, breathing city because apart from those symbols, you see satellite dishes. And then of course, a football pitch. People live here. They're not just praying here. It's not just about pilgrims, citizens live here as well. Too many tourists fail to see this diversity and focus solely on their own religious beliefs. But only with an open mind can one truly grasp the significance of Jerusalem. And that's why a visit to the Jewish quarter, where the first people to consider the city as holy live, is a must in your itinerary. For over a millennium before Christ, the Jews dominated the old city. But after Roman, Arab, Christian, and Ottoman conquests in the next 2,000 years, many were driven out, and the few that remained became a persecuted minority, living in a squalid corner of Jerusalem, the Jewish quarter as it came to be. Captured by the Israeli army in 1967 and controlled since, the old quarter was quickly rebuilt. The synagogues reopened. The population grew and the streets and squares of the neighborhood gentrified to a certain degree. Hard as some try, it's impossible to ignore over a thousand years of Arab roots in this city. Here in Jerusalem, the Jews, the Christians, and the Arabs disagree on so many things, but at least there's one thing they can agree on. It's food. Arabian falafel and shawarma. This is what you call food diplomacy. But unlike food, faith is a more contentious thing. Nowhere else is this felt more than at the Temple Mount that straddles the Jewish and Muslim quarters of the city. Ha Harbayit for the Jews, Haram al-Sharif for the Muslims. The Temple Mount is sacred to both faiths. Solomon's Temple and later Herod's was built over the rock where Jews believe Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac. After a Jewish revolt, the Romans destroyed the temple completely. For the Muslims, they believe the mount was where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven on Burak, his steed. They built the magnificent dome of the rock 
in the Al-Aqsa Mosque to commemorate this holy feat. The Temple Mount that dominates Jerusalem takes up a mere 14 hectares, but it's the center of the world for both faiths and the center of the conflict. The chief rabbi says it's forbidden for Jews to climb the Temple Mount, no matter how sacred the site is for Jews. But there's a political reason as well. Doing so could start another war. With no access to the mount, Jews worship at the ancient temple's western wall instead, the closest they can get to the Holy of Holies, where they believe God himself is present. Jews from all over the world come to touch the Wailing Wall or the Temple Wall. They believe by being here and praying here, you're in direct communication with God. Non-Jews like me can visit too, though you need to follow some basic rules like cleanse at a fountain before entering, and cover your head with a hat or a skull cap. The ladies are segregated by a screen. Despite protests from liberal and feminist Jews, the orthodox practice of separating men and women during worship is a current rule. The Western Retaining Wall, or Kotel in Hebrew, is also called the Wailing Wall, and to express sorrow over their long-lost temple, observant Jews engage in ritual weeping. Prayers are done in silent, or written and slipped into cracks in the wall. While non-observant Jews come out of respect for their ancestors' culture or snap a selfie, it's the ultra-Orthodox Jews that take their visits far more seriously. Young and old in traditional dress come to pray and study scripture every day. You find them in deep reflection under Wilson's Arch, a cavernous section of the wall that houses sacred scrolls of the Torah, Judaism's holiest book. When we return after the break, we leave the Jewish quarter and explore the Muslim district of the city with its exotic souks and arabesque street architecture. Then we'll follow the last footsteps of Jesus along the Via Dolorosa, the Christendom's holiest place.